Hey guys, what's up? How are you? Welcome back. It's me, Hebot, coming at you from my car with another video. And the title, obviously, of this video was going to be The Importance of Exclusives and the Difference Between Anti-Consumer Exclusives. And, um... I wanted to get the kind of got inspired sort of to do this video based off uh, a video I just seen earlier today by RGT85. You know, you guys know who he is. He has over 450,000 subscribers. I'm very small, but you know, I don't really follow his stuff, but he had the title about, you know, that how, you know, people saying that exclusives are anti consumer what the F is that and stuff like that so his video it was okay it wasn't too bad problem is that these guys don't know how to give a lot of the details and the differences because there are differences and in, in, in why exclusives are important or the importance of exclusives on consoles right and there is uh, a difference between anti-consumer exclusives that is a thing and he didn't really address that. He didn't really say that. Uh, and then when he did get into some details, he didn't really expand on them. So hopefully, I'm going to give you my thoughts, expand on what he was talking about, put my own thoughts, and tell you my own feelings, my own ideas based on what I know and my knowledge. Because he was gaming, he said he was gaming since 85. I've been gaming since 79. You know, that I have a, a, at least six, seven years uh, ahead of him. And I was there during other times that he wasn't like you know the, the the rise and fall of atari when pong started coming out and things like in television and and you know and uh, uh, uh odyssey and stuff of that nature you know consoles of that nature so a lot of you may agree with me with this video and they're probably not going to agree with me and that's okay these are my thoughts and this is what i'm what i want to elaborate and talk about so the the reason why console exclusives are important right is because console exclusives is what gives the console its identity right it's like when you're buying a car although the idea of the car is the same that it drives it has four wheels you put gas you steer it and you takes you from place to place the way car looks the design of cars whether it's an suv a sedan a sports car are all different and there's different companies that manufacture different cars that give you different types of looks. And if you want, let's say, a car from, let's say, Hyundai, because they offer you, let's say, a Sonata, you can only get a Sonata if you buy a Hyundai. And that logic applies to consoles. If you want to buy a console that only offers you a game like Halo or a game like God of War or a game like Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, right? Then those are the game consoles that you have to purchase in order to play those set games. And in many cases, a lot of people are just happy playing just exclusives from one console. Like, let's say they want to play exclusives for, let's say... Uh, um, like, you know, for example, um, these are things, and these are the reasons, I, I kind of lost my train of thought, that's what happens when you have to deal with a thousand things and get interrupted, but anyway, um, are the reasons why a console exclusive is why, uh, you go and buy that set console, and like I was trying to say, that some people... They're happy with just playing, let's say, a PlayStation exclusive only, Xbox exclusive only, or Nintendo exclusive only. But if you're someone like myself, which there's a lot of people like me, that I enjoy playing all types of games, even though I have a preferred console or a platform, right? I'll still go out and buy the exclusives on, let's say, a PlayStation or on an, uh, a Nintendo. And if I don't feel that it warrants the price point of when it comes out, like let's say if it's a game $60, I'll just wait until the game's on sale and I buy it, right? 
Um, and that's why you buy these consoles. It's like when you go and eat in a restaurant and you go to McDonald's, you want their Burger King, I mean, their, their Big Mac versus when you go to Burger King, for example. And these are just examples because those are not really healthy foods. I get it. Uh, you buy a Whopper. I know I'm not going to get a Whopper and what it tastes like, how it's done in McDonald's. So I have to go to Burger King. And that's why I'll choose to go to Burger King because I want my Whopper, for example. And it's the same mentality with anything, with clothing, sneakers. When you buy Jordans, all Jordans don't look the same. That's like me saying I want the LeBron James, the Kobe Bryants, and the Jordans all to look the same and the same style. Because I don't, because it's anti-consumer if they look different. No, they look, they have to look different so you have choices, so that you have different options in what you're going to wear, how you're going to wear it, and how they look on your feet, for example, with your attire, with your clothes. It's the same mindset with consoles. You play certain games because those are the games that identify, that give those consoles the identity of set consoles. You know when you go play Halo, that means you're got, you're playing on Xbox or at least in the Xbox ecosystem, okay? But the biggest difference is, which my boy RGT85 didn't touch on, was that even back then, when companies did multi-plats, for example, and this is just an example, if you bought, because he mentioned the game Aladdin, for example, um, versus the NES or the Super Nintendo versus the Genesis, right? When you bought each version of those games, even though it was the same game based on the same cartoon or animation and world, each game was made differently. One had different levels, a different art style, and the uh, versus the other. And for the example, in Aladdin's case, Capcom did the Aladdin version. In the case of the Aladdin for Genesis, it was done by the Disney distributors, right? And the Disney uh, house, like animations, uh, gaming studios that were developing games at that time, right? So that's what that is what the biggest difference was, even back then with actual multiplats, which that doesn't even exist anymore. You buy a game now for for PlayStation Five or or the Xbox Series X, and they're both the same game. The only difference now is the resolution, the quality of the video, the quality of the frame rate, things like that. But it, it's not that the game is based on, the, let's say, uh, the same world, but it's actually a whole different game. Like they did with the Wii U. The last time I saw that, for example, was with the Wii, right? Because the Wii was less capable of doing certain things based on power. So when the real Ghostbusters game came out, she's so serious. When the real Ghostbusters game came out, um, 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 like I was trying to say that that now, that is not the case. You buy call, uh, you know what I was saying with the with the real Ghostbusters, right? Um, on the Wii because it was capable hardware wise. If you played the real Ghostbusters game. It looked completely different than what you play when you played the real Ghostbusters game on 360 and PS4, which they did the remaster for Xbox One and PS4 not too long ago. But it was the same game based off the same material, but was actually a different game altogether when you played it. And that's, those that was even that was the difference. Even then, back then, you had a reason to buy the games are multi are multiple consoles. So if you bought Call of Duty, the PS5 version, for example, you bought the one for Xbox, you had to buy both because they both gave you a different look and feel and experience. You understand? And that is something that the gaming industry has gotten away because of the cost of gaming has gotten too high. But in my personal opinion, if that even existed today and they brought that type of idea back, I think it would help sales gain, gain ground, mean grow, on every console because 
people will buy the Xbox version because it's different from the PS5 version or even the Nintendo version because they have their own identity. You see? And that's something that he, you know, a lot of people don't even talk about, but I always try to remind people because that's how it was. When you bought, a, 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 you know, the, the, the Tom and Jerry game on the NES versus the Genesis, it was something different. Or the, NES, or the Master System versus the NES. It, or it was something different. That is why sales and games predominantly sold better, right? Because people had a reason to buy both versions, right? Unless it, it not came along when it was a, a brand new IP or unique game. Because it was something in, like in the arcades, like in the case of Mortal Kombat, they always left it the same because that was the game people wanted that were in the arcades, like Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat. The difference was that one had blood, one didn't, because Nintendo was more, you know, family-centric versus, you know, Sega, that were they were for, more for the entire... Um, it didn't matter. It was for the entire uh, age bracket, whether you were younger, whether you were older. It just didn't have as much restrictions, right? And that that was when you got a game that was the same and made sense, right? Like if you got uh, you know Tekken on on both consoles, you got that same game. Uh, and the difference would be what whatever console was more powerful than the other, or had other features better than the other. That console would offer you something more than the other because, or other for a certain features versus the other because of the fact that you know it had better features or it had better more power or whatever the case may be etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. like double dragon comes to mind for the master system versus the nes the double dragon followed more the arcade formula with two player co-op with the genesis version versus the nes version which came out and i mean master system version which which the nes version when it came out it was trying to do a mixture of the arcade with you know their own take to make it longer in the home version to make you feel like you had a bigger bang for your buck but it, it just detracted way too far from the arcade version so a lot of people didn't like it as much because they wanted the arcade version and they never got that with the nes version but they did with the sega master system version right and there's a lot of details that go into these ideas and thought process of what's going on now that is why it's important that you have console exclusives because you want that exclusive to identify and give the 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 the, the personality of that brand and that console. I want I know that when I want to play Halo, I have to go on Xbox. I know when I want to play Gears, I have to go on Xbox. Forza, I have to go on Xbox. You know, other things like Sea of Thieves now on Xbox, Crackdown on Xbox, State of Decay, I got to be on an Xbox. On a PlayStation, I know if I want to play, you know, uh, Ratchet, I got to go there. I know that if I want to play, um, you know, God of War or Uncharted, I got to go there. Because those are their IPs. Those are the games that I want to play that are theirs on that console, right? And that's the whole reason. It gives the console its identity. Which is nothing wrong with that because the same way, like I said, that we like to wear different clothing, buy different cars, buy different foods from certain places. That is why it's okay to have console exclusives because it's a well, reason for you buying that product and that brand and that set console. Because if it was all under the same console, then there won't be no identity. There won't be no reason to have an uh, Xbox console. There won't be reason to have a PlayStation or a Nintendo it would just be one box and you and they'd be all become game developers and just make games. And the reality would be that it wouldn't have the feel and differences because all the games would just be under one bracket and maybe the creativity won't be as expanded, right? The ideas. Because they're not trying to create things based off the quality and the personality of those consoles. Right? That's why they're still important. Whether you think that we're not needed or not, it's irrelevant. That's not a fact. You need it because it's what identifies each brand. And it's what gives those brands their identity. Now, what difference is that, yes, RGT85, there is anti-consumer exclusives. Absolutely. 1,000%. 
perfect example. Spider-Man, anti-consumer exclusive. Oh, why is that? Because Sony owns the rights to the Spider-Man movies. Disney Marvel owns the rights to the entertainment media aspects, which includes video games. They wanted Spider-Man in the movies. They went to Sony. Sony said, well, you can give us. Okay, we'll give you exclusivity to Spider-Man games. When the Spider-Man IP does not belong to Sony. Never has. Don't belong to Xbox. It doesn't belong to Nintendo. And to make matters worse and, and add the insult to the injury, Sony did not pay for the development of the game. It was Disney Marvel. All Sony paid for was the marketing for the game because it was an exclusive to their console. So they paid for those commercials. They paid for the box art so it could be on their on their on their box because they want to make sure that people know, oh, it's exclusive to our console, but they did not pay for it. You see? That is an anti-consumer exclusive. Another great example. Kina. No, not Kina. For, the Forspoken. Or Final Fantasy VII Remake. Or even Final Fantasy XVI. The new one that's going to come out. All IPs that are not, number one, owned by Sony. Number two, they're not paying for the actual development of the game. All they're doing is paying for an exclusivity to keep it on their console only. Even though they don't own it. Even though it's owned by a multi-plat developer. Right? which is Square, to keep it off Xbox or to keep it off Nintendo Switch. That is an anti-consumer exclusive. Now, what is an, not an anti-consumer exclusive? What is fair game? Dead Rising 3. Dead Rising 3. Oh, but that's because of the next box game. That's why you're saying that he bought... No. Because Dead Rising 3 was funded that was published and it was marketed by Microsoft. They paid for the whole cost of it. And Capcom's name was still there. And if it wasn't for them, using even the cloud service to, you know, do the procedurally generated zombies that is in part three, every time you play, you see the differences in zombies all the time, or they're never in the same area. That's what they they use for with the cloud. That game would not have existed. Microsoft paid and took the whole bill. And Capcom just reaped the benefits and they split the call, the winnings. Microsoft split the earnings with Capcom because it's their IP and they own it. So they paid for everything. That was a deal. That was the same way that they did with Street Fighter 6 or Street Fighter 5. Sony did pay for the exclusivity and they, I believe they paid for the development as well in that case. But it was the creator who went to Sony because he wanted it on PlayStation and not on Xbox. That was an anti-consumer practice and move on him being the creator, right? Even though it's owned by Capcom, but he works with them and it is his creation. They gave him the freedom of going where he wanted to go and he chose PlayStation because he didn't want it on Xbox. And that's what he said, which now he's not even there anymore. Right? Capcom fired him or let him go. So, that is a case where it's fair game because they paid for it. So, only paid for it. They paid for the development, publishing, and marketing. No problem. That's fair game. But when you don't pay for something, right? Like, I believe in the case of like Astro Chain and in the case of Bayonetta 3, for example. Nintendo went to Platinum, Platinum, you know, said, yeah, we want to do it. They fit the bill. They funded it. That's why it's exclusive to their console. Makes perfect sense. But they don't own the IP. You see? But with the case of, let's say, of Ultimate Alliance 3, Marvel vs. Capcom Ultimate Alliance 3, that wasn't owned at all by Nintendo. And Nintendo didn't fit the bill. They didn't pay for the development process. They did not pay for the funding of the game. They only paid for the marketing to market it because it was exclusive to their console. They didn't pay for the exclusivity. It, um, it was them approached by Marvel and they made a deal. So that was the exclusivity, how they got it. 
but they didn't pay for the development process. You see what I'm saying? I think they just paid for the marketing because it was exclusive to the Switch. And that, again, is one of those cases that it should not be exclusive because they didn't fit the bill. They didn't do, they did nothing. They just got an exclusive, paid for that exclusivity and marketing, and marketed it, but didn't really fit the bill for the game. And even in a case like that, back in the day, like what they did with Street Fighter, Street Fighter was first exclusive for like a year and a half, I believe, on the Super NES, when it, or two years. Then it finally came to the Genesis. And it came under another name, or an extended name, like a director's cut, if you will. It was a Street Fighter Championship Edition. And that is how they were able to bring it out to Genesis. Because they had new content, more modes, uh, even uh, different variations in the actual levels of set fighters, right? That they look different and stuff like that. And that is something that could still apply to something like even Spider-Man for the PlayStation 4. Or it could apply to even Ultimate Alliance 3 on the Switch. Because they can actually re-release them on other consoles under a different moniker. Like Spider-Man PS4 could be uh, uh, Spider-Man the Director's Cut. You see what I'm saying? We added stuff, added content and stuff you know, in particular. And you can actually release it on an Xbox or on, let's say, a Nintendo Switch, right? And still, it has a unique version attached to PS4 or in PS5, and then it'll have a unique version to Xbox and Nintendo Switch. You can still get away and do that because it's per it's perfectly fair and, and fine. But they don't do that nowadays, right? They act as if they own the the, the shit or uh, can't bring it out and leave it stuck there. That is an anti-consumer practice. Then you have obviously the uh, mentality of developers where they use the excuse of, oh, I want my games to do better, right? So I want to guarantee more sales, so I'm going to put it in the console that sells the most, which is the leading platform. That's what that's called. So they'll put it on, say, a PlayStation or a Switch, right? And then you see that the games don't do well or don't sell. Then the game gets, you know, clearest out, the developer closed down, and the game stays stuck on one platform. You see? And this has happened to games like Adrift, The Last Tinker, Astral Breed, you know, a lot of, of different games that came out on other consoles, you know what I mean? And then they didn't make it to the Xbox, for example, because they didn't have enough, uh, you know, enough uh, enough uh, sales that's a dumb anti-consumer way of doing things or you have the nationalistic the nationalistic practices like because Japanese developers only like doing their product on a Japanese product or set console they'll only bring it out to that console instead of bringing it out to every other console. Or they only bring it out to a Nintendo or a PlayStation because they're Japanese products. That's a whole other, other anti-consumer way of thinking and relic way of thinking, which our brother RGT also didn't hit on, right? Or also didn't bring up, which is a fact. It exists. That's why a lot of those smaller Japanese games like Hidden Dragon and, uh, you know, Fist of the North Star, which was published by Sega, by the way. Berserk. Right? Even Persona for a long time. We're only on Nintendo or PlayStation. And not on Xbox. All because of anti consumer practice. The only reason Persona's coming now is because Namco got a fat check from Xbox up front to put it on Game Pass. And that's why they're putting it there. If it wasn't for that, they wouldn't have put it on Xbox. Because on PlayStation and Nintendo, they didn't have to they didn't get paid nothing up front. They just put it there. That's it. And the games didn't do well at all. You understand? So that's a big deal factor. So again, that's a whole different scenario where you got these developers that are anti-consumer because against my like 
an American company, for example, like Microsoft, and choose not to put their games there. Sega did it for a very long time with the Yakuza series. As soon as they got that check from Microsoft, though, to put it on Game Pass, what did they do? They took it. They ran with it. And then the game did well on Game Pass, and people actually even bought the games. You see? Those are the differences, and there's the different levels, the things within the industry based and about the subject on exclusives. So yes, exclusives are important for consoles. There has there is an importance to have exclusives on your set consoles. But there also is a true thing that exists called anti-consumer exclusives, which our brother RG3 T did not put it and did not explain because he made it seem as if that's not a real thing or that it's okay if they don't put games on the consoles even though their clauses, like in the case of the Spider-Man game, that say that should not be the case. Perfect example, Wolverine. Wolverine, what the what business does Wolverine have being exclusive on PlayStation if, one, they don't own the movie rights to Wolverine, two, Wolverine has always been on multi-plat, right? And it belongs to Disney Marvel. It don't belong to Sony. So why the hell is it exclusive to them? I don't care if the game, uh, if the game did well or on sales more than any other video game before. You know why it did well and better than any other video game before? The Spider-Man game, for example, as far as superhero games, next to Batman. You know why it did well for Marvel? Because Marvel never funded any of the games before this one. When Marvel did the deal with Activision that they brought out all those games for, for you know, for Spider-Man, the deal was Activision would make the games, fund it, and then they would split the cost with Marvel games to give them a, a profit because it's their IP. That's why the games didn't have bigger budgets. Even though they still have very good games with more creative ideas like Shattered Dimensions, for example. Like Friend of Foes. Like Amazing Spider-Man 1 and 2. Like Edge of Tomorrow. Creative games that didn't feel the same within the universe of Spider-Man, for example. What happened with the Sega deal? With the Sega deal, the Thor, uh, the, even the Green Lantern game, the the Spider-Man game, the, no, the two Iron Man games and the Hulk game, right? The Captain America. Sega fit the bill for all those games. And Sega, we all know at that time, was already hem hemorrhaging for money. They didn't have a lot of money like they used to. So they could only put a certain amount of money for each set game. On top of paying Marvel Games for leasing the IP to them. Right? And that's why those games, even though they had a lot of potential, had a lot of bugs and needed fixes. The one that came out the best out of all of them was Captain America. Because it was the last one and they took all the money they made from the other ones to fund that one. And they were able to polish that one the most. And it's an awesome game. That really didn't sell because people didn't give it a chance. Okay? So now with this one, that came out on PlayStation 4 because they have money and they're the ones funding it, right? With their studio, under their moniker. That is why the game felt like it had more quality versus, you know, in, in the acting, let's say, or with the graphics, with the CGI cutscenes. And that is the difference in why the game did so well and became more mainstream. Because it was a game that had more high quality to it. Even though the other games did, but they weren't marketed as much and they weren't uh, as promoted as, as much because the budget came from Activision, not from Marvel games. So that idea of them, oh, wow, well, it did well because it was on place. No, it did well because you finally put some real money into it with some real cash money flow to make it high quality or at least have a high quality feel to it right with with the production value for example in the game that gets people's interest that catches people's interest that's the difference between a lower tier game and a triple a game when you look at it does it mean that those single a or 
double A games are not as good and quality in the game. A lot of times they're even better. But since they don't have that production value or marketing value or marketing budget, people don't look at them over, they get overlooked and then they don't do well. Because in order for you to sell something, you have to market the crap out of it so people can see it and it catches it. all the regular consumers or the casuals attention. And that's what Spider-Man did. So that's the biggest difference. That is why Spider-Man sold a lot more on P the PS4 version than any other Spider-Man before it. Because that is why Batman Arkham, the series, had six, so much success. Because they had a big budget, WB gave it a big budget, they stood behind it, and they marketed it very well, and the game had high quality and high production value. Just like you see with the upcoming Gotham Knights. Those are the biggest difference. And that's why that game franchise did so well. But those are the details that a lot of people out here do these videos. But don't have the audacity or don't know how to remember how to explain those de details and differences. And they're very important. Because they all play, play a part in whatever is going on based on that set topic or subject of what you're talking about those are my thoughts guys let me know what you think down in the comments below let me know if you agree if you don't agree it's okay it's all right that's how it's supposed to be or how it should be we're all different we all have different mindsets we're supposed to be different so that's okay i'm not gonna get mad at you now and it's always good for conversation you know, or a gaming conversation. Guys, leave a thumbs up if you like. Leave a thumbs down if you didn't like. Share this video with someone you think might like it and enjoy it as well. And as always, uh, you guys can follow me in any of the social media that I'm available in. It's all down in the description below of the video. On this video, will be down in the description as well, in the description section. So if you want to follow me there and take a look at what I do, you can because it'll be there. Um or even online, in one of the online services. You can find me in any of the ones that is down in the description as well. As always, if you guys wanna help me out in any way, shape, or form, because you like what I do, you like my channel, you enjoy what I do, and just wanna help me out because of the kindness of your heart, there's a way you can do so. And it's also down in the description below with my PayPal and Patreon information. Or if you wanna donate anything to my channel so I can highlight it, review it, you know, showcase it. It would be an honor. I would be more than glad to do so. Just hit me up on one of the DMs and any of the social platforms and we'll work out the particulars so where you can send it, how we can do it. I'll see you guys in the next one. This is your boy Hebot signing off. Love you guys. Have a great day. God bless and I'll see you guys real soon. Peace.